All right, welcome everyone. All right, so as we have everyone just, you know, joining us through the waiting room, I'll go ahead and get us started. Thank you, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Shanika Peck and I'm an education specialist at Foundations Inc. Welcome to our Beyond the Conference webinar series. Today we have Aaron Moat from Innovate EDU and we'll be getting started shortly. But before uh, we do, I just wanna give you a quick little background about Foundations Inc. We are a national education nonprofit located in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. And our mission is to improve the quality of education by building the skills of educators. So we work with uh, educators from across the school day, with after school programs, schools, districts, and states to create a brighter future for every child every day. So if you're interested in learning more about foundations, I'll go ahead and share our link in addition to our social media that you can go ahead and connect to into the chat. Also, I just want to make sure everyone is aware that we have our uh, one of our biggest signature professional learning experience, the Beyond School Hours Conference, which is happening next month, February 14th to the 17th. And we would love for you all to join us as our guests. We have a keynote AI panel that you definitely do not want to miss. So if you haven't already done so, go ahead and book your flight, your hotel. We will be getting things started right after Mardi Gras. Now, just so you know that this webinar will be recorded and archived on our website and YouTube. So you'll be able to access that later in addition to the resources that we will share during this webinar. There will also be a Q&A session towards the end of the webinar today. So please hold on to your questions and we will gladly answer them during the last 20 minutes of the webinar. Now I'll go ahead and turn it over to Melvina Mitchie, our Senior Advisor of Strategic Partnerships and Grants. Good afternoon. Um, it's, good, it's my pleasure to actually introduce the speaker today. It's my pleasure to introduce Erin Moat, our AI, AI expert for today's webinar. Erin is Executive Director of, and Co-Founder of Innovative EDU. In this role, Erin leads the organization and is a major in major projects, including technology products, development, work on data, interoperable um, systems and data, as well as an urban education fellowship for new educators. Erin leads her organization with working on creating uncommon alliances to create system change in special education, talent development, and data um, <clears throat> innovation. And enter as an enterprise architect, Erin created with her team, two of Innovative Ed's signature technology products, Cortex, a new generation personalized learning platform and Landing Zone, a cutting edge infrastructure as a service data product. So without further ado, I turn you over to Erin. She's an exceptional um, speaker as well as very knowledgeable in her field. And I was thoroughly just um, mesmerized just when I first met her. So I'm sure that this webinar will lead you to that same conclusion. There well, you go. Thank Andrew. you. Thank <laughs> you so much, Malvina. I'm so excited to join this amazing team at Foundations Inc. today. Um, and thank you for the gracious introduction. Uh, three things that bio doesn't say about me, but are really important for the way I think about AI and education. First, um, I'm a mom, so I have two kids, uh, one's five, one's eight, um, and one of my young people um, is a student who learns differently, is a student with learning differences, so I'm constantly thinking about the equitable use of technology and how we make sure that the work we're doing in technology, in education, serves um, and takes care of our most marginalized students. Um, the second thing that bio sometimes doesn't highlight, but I think is really important, is I'm an educator. I founded a school in downtown Brooklyn called Brooklyn Lab Charter Schools, um, and I've had the immense privilege over the last 10 years to watch that school grow um, to be a comprehensive 612. 
And then the third thing, which I have to mention this week, is I am a Michigan Wolverine. Um, and it's great to be a Michigan Wolverine and a national champion. Um, and so I'm I'm tucking it in everywhere I can um, and in perpetuity so that uh, we can memorialize this great win we've had uh, for our football team. But I'm here to talk to you about AI today. I'm going to share some slides um, with you. And it's also great to see some of our partners like the AI Education Project on here. Hi, Ren. Um, and really pleased to share some resources. So I hope you will hold your questions to the end so we can have 20 minutes of hopefully interactive dialogue where we can talk um, about some of the most pressing challenges you might be having as an educator, policymaker, decision maker in your classrooms and schools. So I am gonna get started. And I'm hoping if someone could just give me a thumbs up that they can see, awesome, thank you so much. Um, so uh, today we're gonna talk about the things that you can do right now um, as an educator to engage in AI. And these, I hope, are the four things that you learn coming out of this um, webinar. I love a good learning objective, as I'm sure most of you do. Um, so first, how do you use something called the SAFE framework to engage with AI um, in education? Second, to have a good understanding, if you're an educator who's using these technologies um, with young people, what are the rules of the road and what are the right use cases to be thinking about at the intersection of AI and education? I'm hoping you're gonna leave here with a toolkit, backpack, whatever virtual thing we have um, that's full of resources um, and think about one fundamental skill to be developed as an educator, which is we're gonna focus on prompt engineering today. And then finally, how as educators, we can be champions for AI literacy in our schools. So that's the road ahead for us over um, our time together. And uh, let's get started on that journey. So um, I'm gonna ask you to actually share with me a little bit um, of your own thoughts. Um, and we're gonna do this by using the reaction button um, in Zoom. You're gonna either use the um, icon for a car is going to be thumbs up and an icon for a doctor is going to be the heart. You should be in your quick default chat bar, which is why they chose I chose them. Um, and a little game of would you rather if, if you ever played this uh, when you were a teenager like I did. Um, so right now, would you rather trust a self-driving car or a doctor powered by AI? So if you are choosing the car... Thumbs up. If you are choosing a doctor, give me a heart um, on your icons. Or if you're Ren and really sophisticated, you can use the car. Okay, we got, we got icons for cars. I don't see anyone who's a heart yet. Oh, I just saw our first heart from Sheila. Great. So I see a lot of hearts. I'm sorry. I see a lot of thumbs up um, rather than hearts. And actually, uh, folks are, the reality is that uh, right now, your doctor is actually powered by AI um, and your car is actually powered by AI. So uh, we've already made these choices and, and it's not a choice anymore. AI is embedded, particularly generative AI and synthesis AI is embedded in everything we do. So whether you drive an electric car um, like a Tesla, or you drive a Ford or Toyota, or you're using Google Maps uh, to get from here to there, you are using AI and generative AI. If you are a doctor and you go to the emergency room um, and you see your doctor right now, that emergency room doctor is using um, generative AI to actually help narrow down what might be your challenge for healthcare. And so ER doctors, for example, can't be a cardiologist and can also be a podiatrist. And so uh, right now across the country, our healthcare is being powered by AI. And so I, I like to do this exercise because one, uh, we don't really have a choice. AI is here. It's like the internet and we've got to engage with it. And it's in our everyday lives. And that means um, it is in education and we have some work to do in education to really be able to respond to this moment. Today, I'm going to really focus on generative AI. 
it's important for me to say a couple things to you about AI. Um, I'm an enterprise architect and a technologist, so I've been working with AI for 20 years. But really what's changed in the last two years is what I would consider the consumer breakthrough of generative AI through chat GPT, through BARD, through different types of large language models. They've broken through that consumer consciousness. It's a little bit like the advent of when BlackBerry or the iPhone was invented. And we went from the internet and email being on our computer terminal to it being in our hands. And so that's the moment we're at. And today I'm really going to focus on generative AI. It's important to name that there are lots of other types of AI out there. Surveillance AI, synthesis AI. We're not going to dig down deep into those today. We're really going to focus on generative AI. But it's important to acknowledge there are different types of AI out there. So when we say AI, we don't just mean generative AI. We mean a whole host of different tools. So at Innovate EDU, I lead, along with my colleague Jordan, uh, the EdSafe AI Alliance. Um, you might have heard of the SAFE framework if you uh, follow a policy, particularly at the federal level or globally. Um, the SAFE framework is the dominant framework right now that's being used by governments across the country in the policymaking uh, space. And the EdSafe AI uh, Alliance is focused at the intersection of education um, and AI. And so um, just to show you a little bit of the folks who make up the steering committee at the EdSafe AI Alliance, um, it's everyone from folks who are representing teachers, like our teacher unions, to folks who are representing the digital uh, inclusion community, to folks who are representing our students with disabilities, to folks who represent the research community. And so at EdSafe AI, we are really trying to bring together this uncommon coalition of actors and uncommon alliance to help take on the challenge of AI and education. It's important also to say that EdSafe has existed for many years. Um, it hasn't, it wasn't invented in the last 12 months. Um, it was founded more than three years ago and really um, saw the looming challenge that was gonna be coming to the education sector around dealing with issues around AI and how could we stand together, row together and prepare our educators for this work. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about where we are and, and maybe some of the pressure that you're feeling. I'm gonna talk for a little bit about the policy context because I think it's really important for folks to understand what's happening from a policy context at the global level, at the federal level, and then at the state level. And then we're really gonna dig down into resources. So this is generally how policy is um, adapted. You know, this is sort of a well-known um, policy framework. Um, so right now we're about here um, on sort of general policy development, but there is massive urgency uh, to get here. You guys are probably hearing this even in your own school board meetings, in state policy discussions. How do we make sure that we're protecting young people? How do we enforce uh you know, actions for folks who might be bad actors? How do we make sure that we're adhering to privacy policies? It's important to name that um, this work is uh, really just getting started and is going to be evolving over the next couple of years very, very quickly. Um, so we use the SAFE framework in order to help guide that policy process. And when you think of the SAFE framework, you really need to think about safety, accountability, fairness and transparency and efficacy. And it's important to name that it's deliberately scaffold, it, scaffolded in this way. We don't want to be thinking about just using an AI tool if we're not first addressing issues of safety. These safety, accountability, fairness, and transparency, for us, we consider these table stakes. And only then do we get to the question whether or not we should be using AI in education. You need to make sure, and this is a dominant message you're going to hear from me at, throughout this entire webinar, that you are being a steward of safety and accountability and fairness um, as an educator on behalf of your young people. 
So the SAFE framework, um, I think it's important to acknowledge that it came from more than 24 different inputs and frameworks that exist um, in the policy space. And we sort of rolled it all up into one policy making template. And so uh, now we're gonna dig down to the federal, state and local level to talk a little bit about what the policy framework looks like. So, um, and then we'll get your resources and tools. So first of all, the US Department of Education has talked a lot about the potential of AI, but they've also released seven principles that I wanna highlight for you about what is best practice of using AI in our school systems, K-12 and higher ed look like. So the first and most important principle is a human being in the loop. So what could this practically look like um, in the world? I'm gonna give a great example here. Right now, there's a lot of pressure to do universal screening for dyslexia um, because we know young people aren't being identified quickly enough um, for those who might have dyslexia and we need to uh, get them as early as possible. But if you've been an educator like me and tried to run screening for dyslexia in a whole classroom, it takes like six weeks uh, to do every single child and do them well. Some of the work that's happening right now is actually some AI tools that are being developed with the National Science Foundation, the Institute for Education Sciences and the University of Buffalo with really high efficacy to do whole child screening, whole classroom screening for dyslexia um, at the K-1-2 um, level. Super exciting, would save teachers tons of time. And the important thing about this screener is it's not just that the screener is gonna say, this kid has dyslexia. What it's gonna say is this kid may have dyslexia and we need a human, an educator to come behind this AI tool and do a full system administration of the assessment. And so while the screener will help us identify who may have dyslexia, it's gonna be the educator and the human in the loop that's gonna really make sure that the AI tool isn't over identifying students or might be identifying students who might have a fluency problem, but it's not dyslexia who might have a comprehension challenge, but it's not dyslexia. So that idea that humans being in the loop as a critical part of our technical infrastructure is among the most important principles that this uh, work lays out. And then you'll see the other six there, which I'm not gonna read to you, because I really want you to remember that for folks who are in education, we need to be advocating for humans and educators to really be at the center of this conversation and to always be in the loop on the deployment of these technologies. And so this is, I think, a really important um, orientation to this idea that if humans are always in the loop, that means that we're centering our students and our teachers and our relationship. So as we're thinking about using AI tools and technologies in our classrooms and our schools, let's be thinking about those technologies and tools that strengthen and deepen the human relationship between students and teachers. Because what we know is that no matter what, a young person's relationship with a caring, qualified adult is the single greatest determinant of what their college matriculation looks like, what their youth mental health outcomes look like. Those connections, those meaningful connections with adults are so very important to learning and development. So what are states saying? Because we don't just exist in the vacuum of the federal government. What states say really matters. Here's what I'm seeing right now, and uh, we'll get to locals in just a second. There is massive movement at the state level right now around AI guidance and policy. And so most of them are following the White House and the AI Bill of Rights and the executive order that came out in October. They're following the US Department of Education guidance, but 42 states have already put commissions in place to develop some guidance. And we have four states, two late breaking news there, West Virginia and North Carolina just came out with guidance this week for educators about the use of AI in the classroom. If you want, if you're an educator in any four of these states, I'm happy to quick link that guidance if you haven't seen that already. But what I want you to know is that states are moving here. And as an educator in school or as an administrator in a district, you should anticipate um, your state education agency coming out with some sort of guidance 
um, that's happening. It's also important to name that existing data privacy, cybersecurity policies that exist at states govern the use of AI right now. There's not specific carve outs for generative AI technology. And so it's really important to have an understanding that nothing about generative AI um, or its use of tools in classrooms doesn't mean you don't have to comply with um, IDEA or FERPA or COPPA. So let's be really clear about what the rules of the road are. Um, so this gives you a quick map. This is December, 2023. It's already changed uh, as of January, 2024, but this is where folks are already putting privacy laws in place or where new privacy laws are being drafted. You can see that there's a lot happening right now and a lot of movement just in the last month around what's happening at the regulation of privacy and security and AI. And I think it's really important that as educators, we're aware of what's happening. These are the four buckets that these laws are really thinking about. So privacy, particularly facial recognition and recommender systems, in New York, for example, the state of New York has outlawed the use of facial recognition technology in education. Bias and discrimination. So where could automated scoring systems potentially perpetrate racial or gender bias as it when it comes to assessments? Surveillance. So where are some areas where personalized learning systems might be using AI to surveil students? and potentially recommend pathways that don't allow for opt-out. And then really thinking about predictive systems. So how does it sometimes, how could AI take away autonomy of students or educators? This is where the policy making around risks is really happening. And it's important that you're aware that these are the four big buckets in terms of risk profiles that policy and legal challenges are happening around. So, Here's my rules of the road. If you remember one slide from this entire presentation, this is the one slide I want you to pay attention to because I think it's incumbent on all of us to be really clear with educators what the rules of the road are right now. So uh, first of all, never enter personally identifiable information about a student or even yourself in a generative AI model. It's the advice I give to every single person that I talk to. These models do not yet have the type of privacy and security protections that would protect your personally identifiable data. So even if you're an educator who's like, here's the first and last names of my students and create cute forest creature names, because that's the theme of our class this year is forest creatures, don't do that. Don't put them into the generative AI model no personally identifiable information. I'm gonna dig down into what you need to guard against. Never use consumer AI tools with children under the age of 13 in your classrooms. It is, it is against every acceptable use policy of every single consumer large language model, GPT, BAR, DALE, everything out there. You cannot use these tools with young people under the age of 13. Don't do it. You're breaking the acceptable use policy of the tool itself. And that has long ranging comp like complications legally, but also um, for federal privacy laws. Finally, if you have students who are over the age of 13, 13 plus, um, you can use these tools in the classroom, but you must have affirmative parental consent in order to do that. So, um, some models, which I'm going to talk about in just a second, um, like BARD, um, which is Google's generative AI model, um, they don't even allow you to use it for young people under the age of 18, and they've blocked it in many of their in-suite tools, including Google Workspace for Education, any Google account with Family Link, um, any tool that they think has a predominant user base that is uh, under the age of 18. So any use of GPT or similar um, tools, you need to, when you're doing this work, make sure there's no reference to individuals, events, locations, or anything that could be pieced together to identify those students or you in that prompt. Never use real student names, never use birth dates, never use that type of thing. The models right now are not at a place 
where you can put that data in. That doesn't mean there's not going to be some evolution in the future towards small language models, closed language models, closed language sets that are going to be able to happen inside one district. We're working with a district right now who's building their own closed model for this development. But right now, nothing in the consumer space is safe. And I want you to hear that. So now that I've scared you, I'm going to talk to you about how you as an educator, as an adult, uh, in a green use case, can use AI and why um, it can be a huge tool for you as an educator. So I did all the doom and gloom. Now I'm here to talk to you about opportunities and partnership. So um, if you have never engaged uh, with Gen AI, can you use an icon and give me a thumbs up in the view? Never engaged with Gen AI. You've never used chat GPT. You've never used any. Great. Thanks, Richard. I appreciate it. Well, for some of you that are beginners um, and for some of you that have maybe engaged with the tool, one of the most important things to think about when you're using these tools is how you ask them questions and how you engage in the tool. And so how you ask a question in generative AI really matters. And some of the things that are really important when you're thinking about building these um, questions is what role you take as the question maker and what you put in, in terms of timeline, what you put in, in terms of results, what you put in, in terms of outcomes. And like everything in education, context really matters. And so these are five elements that you can put into what we're going to call, I'm going to teach you a new word. It's called prompting um, generative AI. That's how you ask it a question. These are five elements of good prompts. And so first is the instruction. What are you trying to accomplish? What context can you offer? So how do you think about you're giving the generative AI some information about maybe, I wanna build a lesson plan for chemistry. I wanna build a lesson plan for chemistry for students who are being introduced to the basics, for students in the fifth grade, for students who are in the fifth grade and wanna do project-based learning. So the more information that you give across instruction, content, inputs, examples, and outputs, so that output is the lesson plan, the better your prompt is gonna be and the better results you're gonna have. I think this is a super interesting way to think about this. I wanna give the state of North Carolina some credit here. This is something they're just debuting with their educators. They're using this model called Crafty uh, to, to think about how you craft a power prompt. So how do you get what you want from generative AI? And they've come up with the acronym CRAFT context, role, audience, format, task, and tone. So what details can you add? What role are you taking? Are there specific dimensions of the students that you're serving? What format? And then again, what kind of output do you want or what's the type of thing you wanna see? So to become a great prompt engineer, you need to practice. And I, this is the first resource that I wanna share with you as part of this webinar, which is something from our friends at AI for Education who have built what I think is the best prompt library specifically for um, education. So this is just one of their example prompts and they have over a hundred of these example prompts already built out for you to use in generative AI. And the great thing about it is they've done it in a way that really allows that, allows you not to be concerned about the PII risks that we just talked about. They built these prompts in a way to not have specific PII, to have some of that context, that output, that implementation. And so as one of the things that you can do right now as an educator is begin to skill build around prompt engineering become a great prompt engineer. Help train AI and yourself to ask better questions of the tools. And to get started, I would really recommend the AI for Education prompt library. So that's the first skill that you can really build and resource as an educator. 
The second thing I want to talk to you about as an educator is your role in being a champion for AI literacy. So this is data that came out this morning um, from Parent Survey. Literally, I grabbed this this morning from one of our very trusted sources um, at Innovate EDU, who does monthly polling data for us every month. Um, and so this, I think, is really exciting. Um, so right now, today, more to more than a third of school parents have said, I've heard a lot about artificial intelligence. Over 80% have said they've had some awareness. To give you a little bit of context, the same set of questions was asked in November, and it was only over 20% who said they had some awareness. So that cycle of what people are talking about, that consumer breakthrough that I talked about earlier, it's happening. And if you haven't already gotten these questions as an administrator or a teacher, what are you guys doing about AI? How are you thinking about AI? What skills are you building with my students about AI? They're coming for you. And so I think this is really important. First of all, that um, I love the work that they do um, at Morning Consult because I think they are really conscientious about thinking about the different dimensions of our population and and a little bit um, around some of the places where we're gonna see some of these um, gaps that I'm gonna talk about and where we need to be advocates, um, it, particularly around our most marginalized populations. So I wanna pull out some things for you here. Um, first of all, um, there's, a gr there's a big need here for literacy with our parents and with our students around AI. What is AI? If we can together as a community help answer that question for our parents in 2024, We'll make amazing strides to really building the competency, dispositions, and the ability for AI to be used in education to be effective. So there's a lot of work to be done, right? Only a third of parents are saying they know a lot about artificial intelligence. So we have some we have some work to do with our parents and therefore our student communities. But I also want to point out um, the the massive differences here between the top percentage of folks who have heard a lot or some about AI and some of the places where we need to pay attention to our most marginalized communities, particularly our rural communities, particularly our low income communities, and our folks who might be older parents, might not have um, had a college degree um, or further education. That's the place we need to be focusing our education the most and that translates um, when we look at the data into places where we need to be thinking about skill building with students the most. Right now, opportunities for students to engage with AI are happening in more high income schools and more private schools than they are happening in public schools and public education. And so we have a chance right now to turn that tide, but we need to be conscious that that gap is already existing and that divide is already building. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do today is help us address um, that gap and stop that gap from spreading. And we can do that as an education community. We can do that as educators. So how you tackle AI literacy in your school or classroom is I think one of the most pri important priorities of 2024. And I'm gonna talk to you about some of the resources that already exist so that you can do that today. So first of all, coming up on April 19th, you're among the first people to hear this. There will be a National AI Literacy Day with tools and resources for students, for parents, for communities, for superintendents, for state leaders, for educators, for paraprofessionals, for social workers, I could go on and on and on, um, around helping answer the fundamental question, what is AI? It's not like we're building all these resources um, in the next three months. Many of these already exist. And on the National Day of AI Literacy, we'll be curating these resources, curating some exclusive professional development, virtual and asynchronous, but also synchronous professional development um, activities for educators and U.S. school systems across the country. This will be a U.S. focused event. Um, we're really excited about National AI Literacy Day, and we have some great partners in this work. Um, and how can you get involved today in this work? So, um, and again, I already really talked about if we address AI literacy, we can really think about how we overcome some of those gaps with our most marginalized communities. So the first resource I wanna introduce you to today is 
something called five big ideas. And this is something that you can implement right now in your classroom. So this is research that's been going on with the National Science Foundation since 2018. You're gonna hear me harken back to resources that have been being built and have been in development for many years, not things that are brand new to the market, but are really um, have, have a lot of a research base behind them. This is um, an initiative called AI for K-12, and it's really focused on how you develop national guidelines for teaching AI in K-12. And they have five big ideas that they have put forward from this research base. And this is really meant to define what every student should know about AI and what they should be able to do with it. So K through 12, this doesn't touch higher ed. It's an important caveat to give. So the five big ideas are perception, representation and reasoning, learning, natural interaction, and societal impact. And so one of the great things about the five big ideas is they have organized a set of curriculum, resources, lesson plans, pedagogy around these five big ideas and these competencies for how we think about AI um, with our young people in terms of skill building. And this work um, is globally being adopted. So this isn't just US centric, the, the five big ideas, back end work that's happening everywhere from India to UNESCO to the OECD countries. And so as you're thinking about the skill building that you can do as an educator relative to AI literacy, I'd love for you to focus on the five big ideas and to really think about this model. One of the reasons I love this model is because they have a rubric already built by every great band for what students should know and how to build it. And so um, if you go onto their website, you can actually access all of these grade band rubrics around each of these five big ideas around lesson plans as well. And so it's it's sort of a color by number pedagogy and practice around the skill building that's going to be needed relative to AI and education. And there's some other great orgs who are doing this work. Code.org's Teach, for, uh, Teach AI initiative does this. AIEDU's Foundations initiative does this as well. And so there's lots of resources out there to do that. And here's what I call a big share. Um, here's four ready-made resources with lesson plans right now by grade band that you can jump in and begin to be a champion of AI literacy. So um, Craft from our friends at Stanford has lessons for everything from AI and art to AI and bias and recognition. Um, AIEDU has a whole treasure trove of professional learning activities for educators, but also some for students. The Tech Interactive, which is a, a place-based museum um, in Silicon Valley, has these really amazing discovery lessons about AI. These are the best project-based experiential learning resources I've come across for the interaction with AI. So if you're a teacher or an educator who has a classroom that's really focused on project-based experiential learning, the tech interactive lessons are the best that I've seen, um, and I would really recommend them. And then finally, our friends at Common Sense Media have some really good AI literacy um, lessons around discernment and teaching young people how to be critical discerners of information. It's important to say that the Common Sense Media lessons are only targeted for students 6 to 12. Um, that's sort of the age appropriateness um, of that level. So if you're a middle school or high school teacher and you're thinking about how can I begin to integrate AI literacy lessons into my work, um, the common sense ones, again, just best in class. Um, and craft is the craft um, database is actually populated um, on an ongoing basis. So it changes every week. So keep checking back um, on that. And then I know our friends at Share My Lesson and some other um, great resource organizations are beginning to put together these resources, particularly lesson plans around AI literacy. So uh, that I promised y'all 20 minutes and I am always uh, want to leave question time and dialogue time. And I'm hoping that we can um, capture some of those questions 
But if you're too shy to ask me or you're standing in the shower tonight and you're like, oh, what should I know? Or I meant to ask her this, feel free to email me and also feel free to reach out to our EdSafe AI team. We're always here to support educators in the field and building your ability to engage with the SAFE framework and work with AI and education in a safe, equitable, fair, transparent format. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope we can get to questions. Yes, that was amazing, Erin. Um, actually, we do have a question as a follow-up to the resources that you've shared. Sure. Um, da, 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 da. Kathy asked if there were any costs um, for these resources. Yeah, everything I've shared is free, creative commons, and open and accessible. So none of these resources should cost you to engage with them. Awesome. All right, and as everyone is probably jotting down their questions, right, <laughs> revisiting their thoughts and maybe their notes from this presentation, um, how about we get started with a question around um, some examples that you've seen as an educator of how AI resources are being implemented in spaces for students under 13 or maybe over 13, and what are some key lessons that we can learn from them? Yeah, I mean, I think right now um, the place that I would consider like a green use case for kids under 13 is really in lessons that educate young people about what AI is. Again, I would not recommend that you're using uh, tools that use consumer to consumer large language models with students under 13. And so the places where I've seen um good sort of skill building when it comes to AI are even paper-based models that help kids understand bias or help understand algorithmic or computational um, thinking. Uh, Common Sense Media continues to add to their trove of um, reviews that they're doing around AI and education tools. I would recommend that as a place for educators to go to see sort of the latest. Um, there's only two tools that have passed um, their review process at this point, and none have passed um, for young people under the age of 13. So uh, just renewing my caution here that um, if you are wanting to think about working with young people in AI under the age of 13, I'd really ask you to think about that aim towards AI literacy and helping them understand uh, digital literacy so that when they get to a place that they can legally engage with these platforms, that they have the ability to discern the information that's coming out. Remember that um, these platforms don't reason. Um, and so the information that you are getting out of generative AI platforms must be interrogated. You can't just copy paste it. You have to really look at it. It's that humans in the loop principle that we talked about first. And so for me, I think this is gonna be a place where as educators, we really need to work to build the skills of our young people to be critical thinkers, to be discerners, to really um, interrogate the information that's coming out of these platforms. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Erin. Um, we're going to move on to the questions that we have in our chat. Uh, first question is from Powell. Any recommendations for conferences for a deeper dive? Lucky you. We have a conference coming up next month. It's the Beyond School Hours Conference. We will have a keynote AI panel um, uh, with great speakers, including Erin Moat, to answer you know those burning questions around AI. So that's a great place to start. If you haven't already, book your flight and your hotel. But Aaron, do you have any other recommendations for conferences to help take a deeper dive into AI and its resources? Yeah, so in my only recommending free resources rule on webinars like this, I'm gonna recommend uh, our friends at ASU GSB are putting on something that they are calling the AI Air Show before ASU GSB. It's completely free for educators. I'm super excited about um, this ability to get together. They anticipate having over 8,000 people at this conference. But one of the cool things about the conference that they're going to be doing is different tracks based on what you're interested in, workshops, that type of thing. And so if you can make it out to San Diego in April, not a burden, um, the conference itself is free. I know getting there might, might cost you something, but um, the ASU GSV Air Show 
which is being built for educators and is really going to be focused on allowing people to take a deep dive into AI for education. I think it's going to be uh, the signature sort of free event um, of the year for um, AI and education. So that's one I would I would recommend if it's not on folks' calendar, free to register. If you are considering, I would register now uh, that conference, uh, even the paid conference, which is very expensive, sells out every year. So, um, and then of course, come see us in New Orleans. We're excited uh, to be together in New Orleans. <laughs> Awesome. And thank you, Ren, for sharing that acronym in the chat for us. Again, it's ASU GSV, right? And it's located where again in uh, San Francisco? Yeah, it's ASU GSV Air Show. It's going to be in San Diego um, towards mid April. Okay. All right. Make sure you add that to your calendars, folks. All right. Next question uh, Daisy asks Are you familiar with? Oh, sorry. Are you familiar with Quill from Google for Education and would you recommend it? Yeah, I'm not going to recommend any products um, on this webinar. I am familiar with Quill. I'm familiar with tools like Grammarly. I think um, it's just I'm, I'm not going to recommend any products at this um, on this webinar. But I think as you're thinking about the products that you might be using in your classrooms and schools, I would really ask you to look at the SAFE framework um, and to look at those reviews that are coming from our friends like Common Sense Media um, who are digging down using the SAFE framework, using a rubric to really evaluate those tools um, and to make sure that they are um, meeting the highest sort of level of privacy and security that's necessary in operating in our schools. The other thing I would say is that um, our friends at COSEN are also working on um, a AI tech tools, uh, I'm gonna call it like repository or library. And so that should be coming out very soon. And so watch this space. I think you're gonna see a lot of organizations trying to make it easier for folks to find great tools that use AI in ways that um, adhere to the SAFE framework. And I would just say that both COSIN and Common Sense are partners of the EdSafe AI Alliance. That's great. Uh, next question is from Jesse. Uh, do you have any examples of use with students in after school programming? Yeah, so I'm gonna call out our great uh, partners in New York City public schools right now who are actually running with students who are 13 and over and who have affirmative parental consent, um, a student policy lab right now at some of their high schools, and they're doing it both in out-of-school time programs and during the school day. And so they're doing everything from uh, building with AI uh, training uh, their young people around how to be great prompt engineers to even working on building some tools and testing um, some AI tools. Uh, again, they're over 13, they have affirmative parental consent. Um, and so they're doing some really great work um, in their after school programming as part of their STEM work and their computer science for all work. So really want to shout out New York City Public Schools and the really amazing work that they're doing. There's um, other folks um, who are in the out of school time or youth um, development world who I think are also really starting to explore AI and STEM, particularly through new lesson plans. Um, again, 13 to 18, I haven't seen anybody doing it under 13 for good reason, um, but happy to share some of those models. At AI Literacy Day um, on April 19th, we'll actually have a subset focused on out of school time and after school programming and folks like the Tech Interactive and some of the museum partners actually have some great um, lessons. And so one of the things, if you're an after school program provider um, and you're looking to uh, potentially do things in AI, but you might not have the skills or you might not have the, the staff to do it, I'd really encourage you to partner with your local science museum or your local um, community library um, in in places that I know, um, even here in Arizona, um, we have our science center who's doing a whole STEM and AI um, unit for girls who are 14 to 18. Um, and so 
you don't have to do this all yourself. Look into your community, look at your science centers, look at some of your community partners who can do that. The tech interactive resources that I shared as well could be done in out of school time programming. They're not just uh, for during the school day. Hopefully that's helpful. Jesse. Yes, abs absolutely. And again, just a reminder for everyone, all the resources and those links that were shared during the webinar will be shared and uploaded on our website. Um, so you'll have access to it, including the presentation. So look, be on the lookout for that. It's definite, it definitely will be available to you all. All right, next question. Oh, and this one's about families, right? It's something that we don't really talk that much about just yet. Uh, what is the best way to engage families who are not familiar with AI? First step, second step, or think about like how to slowly introduce them into this. Yeah, so I think this is a huge uh, piece of the work that we can be uh, doing as educators is speaking to our families um, about what is AI. And so um, our partners in El Segundo School District are doing some amazing work right now um, in holding community conversations uh, with families um, and having just roundtable conversations uh, to first educate them about what is AI and then to hear what their concerns are, um, to hear where they might have a place of coming from a place of fear and then meeting that fear with knowledge. And so I think that that is a great way to engage your families is how do we build knowledge, not fear? How do we help folks understand um, the the, th the most important thing is that we understand that protecting your students' data, we understand protecting student privacy continues to be our first concern. And so here's the things that we're doing to, to do that as a district, as an educator, so on and so forth. When we talk to parents um, out there, whether that's through our partners at National Parents Union, or whether that's in some of the policy lab work we're doing with districts like El Segundo, they are eager for us to engage with this technology. So they just want to know it's safe. Um, and they want to make sure that, uh, you know, this doesn't become the wild west um, of student data or that their student, their students data doesn't show up somewhere um, that they, they lose control of that data. And so um, it's really important that we communicate to our families, um, both what is AI how we're continuing to be stewards um, of the relationships we have with them and the relationships we have with young people. And that these are some of the, you know, these are some of the tools we're gonna be using um, from El Segundo and others. So at uh, during National AI Literacy Day on April 19th, the website will have a whole host of tools and this website will live in perpetuity. So you'll be able to grab these tools at any point. We're capturing the best resources out there so that we can stage uh, conversations and create scripts for conversations with families and with parents. What I would say to you is, um, as somebody who led schools and led a school district, uh, I used to do donuts with dad, muffins with mom, coffee with the co-founders, uh, really just creating space for dialogue with our parents, I think is the first step. And so create that space um, for folks to come to you with any concerns that they might have. Um, we do, it doesn't just have to be in a board meeting. Um, how do we engage with our parents? Um, you know, in a non-adversarial way. Um, and when, and then have an answer. Um, and when parents come to you and say, what do you, how are you thinking about AI in the classroom? Really be able to answer that question. I think um, we know those questions are coming from the survey data that's happening. We know those questions are coming from all segments of our parent populations. We know those questions are coming from students. Um, be ready with an answer. Thank you. So it sounds like um, that free conference happening April 19th. Wait, or is that, I'm sorry, AI Literacy Day. Um, yes. Just want to circle back to that. During that time, additional resources will be shared with all educators around how we can support AI literacy. Absolutely. And we love every, we're going to share the resources ahead of April 19th and we'd love everyone on April 19th to uh take 45 minutes and do a lesson on what is AI, uh, for example, in your classrooms, whether you have kindergartners or 12th graders, so that everyone has that baseline understanding of what is AI. And there'll be resources for uh, principals to have conversations with uh, families and with parents. And so we're really trying to scaffold 
a number of tools, add to that toolkit so that you don't have to invent it uh, yourself or do it yourself, that you can use the resources that are best in class um, that are being deployed. So April 19th, we hope that um, as, a, as a space, as an education sector, we can stand up and really be at the forefront of helping our nation understand what is AI. All right, that's great. All right, and then we have one last question. Actually, maybe two. Uh, first question, could you speak more to AI and STEM in the context of problem-based learning? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, when we, it might be, if, if the person who wrote that, Wesley, if you have a more specific question, but I, I will say that, um, you know, I think, uh, I said earlier in this presentation that AI is like the internet, right? Um, that that's sort of the, this is the level of technology innovation that AI is going to have for us, um, I think in education and in society. And it's already changed the way we interact, whether that's how you select a movie on Netflix or how your bank uh, identifies your spending patterns um, and helps you budget for the next year. So uh, AI is all around us. And, and so when I think about the intersection with STEM skills, I, I think about skills that we're already talking about doing critical skill building around discernment, how we do critical thinking, how we engage in experiential learning, how we think about problem um, problem solving, working um, in multifunctional teams. Um, these continue to be all the skills I think that we know we need to be building for young people. And so uh, to be contributing to the global economy and to be competitive in our workforce. And so um, I was having this debate with my husband the other day, um, you know, if, if the internet um, made knowledge accessible, um, has does AI make expertise accessible? And so how do we think about discerning and thinking through expert opinions? How do we understand um, how we interrogate questions? These are things we need to do whether we're doing fifth grade math or calculus. These are things we need to do whether we're writing um, a paper or we're debating our peer about what a novel looks like. And so I think that these are skills we know we need to be building. Um, but again, I, I go to back to that circle graph that I showed you, those five big ideas um, to really understand um, some of the critical skill builds that are gonna need to happen, not just in STEM learning, but all learning in order to interact with AI. Right, okay. Thank you for that, Erin. Um, da, 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 da. And we have a question about the resource that you referred to, AI for K-12. Is that a good mm -hmm. place to look for content to share with uh, youth under 13? So I'm thinking maybe that skill building and prompting or any other. Yeah, that skill building, those lesson plans, that discernment. You should, you'll, you'll see when you look at, they have it by grade band. So you'll see, it's not by age. So I just want to also say that it's by grade band. So you have to do a little discernment here. Um, we can always have fifth graders who are 10 or 13. Um, so just discerning when it add that caveat, but um, there are great examples of some skill building lessons that you can do some, um, ex some lessons that you can do that um, engage around computer science that engage around uh, some of that discernment, even media literacy. There's a huge number of lessons that exist right now on digital literacy for kids under 13. My caution is really around using consumer-based generative AI platforms in your classrooms. Do not do that if you are working with kids under 13. If your kids are 13 to 18, you need affirmative parental consent. You're just going to hear me hit it over and over and over again. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, and then our last question for this session, um, and this is, we're going back to that um, AI Literacy Day. Uh, we're the first ones to hear about it. Uh, Annette asked if we will, is there a way to get on the list to receive these AI resources and agenda for the 19th? Yep. Go to AILiteracyDay.org. Uh, you'll see that uh, website begin to really come to life over the next uh, four to six weeks. Um, and you'll begin to see how you can actually sign up your district or sign up your school, um, get connected with other schools in your area, get connected with other districts in your area, just have access to the resources. And there'll be some day of 
uh, pretty cool things. I'm super excited about um, in terms of professional learning. Um, it's We're really focused on scale there. Um, so we're really focused on how we can get resources to everyone um, in the country, not just um, you know, in, in place-based resources. So uh, AILiteracyDay.org. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erin, um, for being here with us today. Definitely learned a lot, and I'm so happy to leave away with some resources. I definitely know I'm not the only one here. I'm just going to go ahead and drop a survey for everyone to fill out. Just take a minute or two, just give us some feedback and gather some thoughts on uh, what we can do to improve the next uh, webinar session. Um, before we end, again, I just want to remind everyone that the recording will be available on our website, and including the presentation and resources and links shared today. Um, you'll also find the recording on our YouTube channel. Um, we will also uh, send out a certificate of attendance uh, within a week or so um, for all of you who joined us, uh, joined with us live today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Sylvia for some last and final words. Listen, how do you follow a presentation like this? I'm not going to mess this up by saying anything, trying to be profound. Aaron, you rock. You rock. Drop mic. We love you. Thank you so much. Well done. That was beautiful. <laughs> beautiful words. <laughs> love it. So again, everyone, take a quick minute or two to fill out our survey. Aaron, again, thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. And of course, we look forward to seeing you next month. Aaron, it will be on our AI panel. So if you haven't already registered for our conference next month, please do so. It's definitely something you do not want to miss. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon and have a great rest of your week. Bye y'all.